My first foray into comparative mythology was the book Martian Metamorphoses, a compendium of traditions about the red planet from antiquity until modern times. There I documented that Mars was conceptualized as the archetypal warrior hero and as a central player in the catastrophic natural events attending creation and the ordering of the cosmos. My basic strategy was to investigate the earliest literary and astronomical texts mentioning Mars to see if recurring patterns could be found. In time, I succeeded in identifying well over 200 motifs associated with the Red Planet, including Dragon Slayer, Eclipse Agent, and Fire God. Many of these motifs are shared by Mars gods around the globe, compelling evidence that they trace to the witness behavior of the planet Mars in relatively recent prehistoric times. The picture that emerged from my research is that Mars represented an awe-inspiring celestial form, one prone to drastic distortions in its relative size and luminosity, to say nothing of its propensity for hurling great thunderbolts and generating world-engulfing storms. All of these ideas are difficult to reconcile with Mars's present benign appearance, needless to say. In ancient Mesopotamia, the homeland of the first scientific astronomy, Mars was identified with the god Nergal, the latter described as a raging warrior whose incendiary behavior threatened the world. Numerous hymns attest to Nergal's prowess as an invincible warrior. Quote, warrior, raging storm tide who flattens the lands in upheaval. Warrior. Nurgle's belligerent nature knew no bounds. According to one hymn, the god's wrath threatened the domain of the gods as well. Quote, O warrior, perfect one without rival among all the gods, who grasps the pitiless deluge weapon, who massacres the enemy, lion clad in splendor, at the flaring up of whose brilliance the gods of the inhabited world took to secret places. Babylonian astronomical texts, interestingly, warn that if a person is born during the appearance of Mars, he will be quick to anger. While such traditions can only appear bizarre and incongruous by reference to the red planet's innocuous behavior in today's skies, the fact remains that analogous reports are to be found around the globe. Far removed from ancient Mesopotamia, the Skiddy Pawnee of the North American plains are known to have had an astronomically based religion. Indeed, it has been said that they were obsessed with the planets and had a sky-oriented theology, perhaps without parallel in human history. For the Skiddy sky watchers, Mars was described as an irascible warrior whose interactions with Venus at the time of beginning sparked creation. During a ritual in which human sacrifices were offered to the red planet, the celebrants sought to channel Mars's anger. Quote, I become ferocious. I became like him. End of quote. In another ritual, the Mars impersonator chanted the following refrain when pretending to conquer Venus, quote, I become myself when I become angry, end of quote. Yet another hymn quotes the God himself, this is the way I did when I became angry. Analogous traditions will be found in Egypt, where early astronomical texts identified Mars with the god Horus. In literary texts dating to the 3rd millennium BCE, Horus described as raging against the gods, thereby reminding us of the Akkadian traditions attached to Nurgle. So too, in the pyramid text, Horus is described as the Lord of Wrath, whose seething fury shakes the very foundations of heaven. Quote, Unus will come with the face of this great god Horus, who is Lord of the Wrath. He will strike Shu's arms from under the sky. End of quote. The Latin god Mars, whose name was assigned to the red planet during Hellenistic times, was remembered as a warrior whose terrible fury knew no bounds. Although the vast majority of Roman mythology has been lost, a few vestigial remnants can still be found. The Carmen of Arla, the oldest bit of Latin text from antiquity, invokes Ferra Mars, literally the fierce or furious Mars. In his classic archaic Roman religion, George Dumazil offered the following portrait of the Roman war god. Quote, the ambiguous character of Mars, when he breaks loose on the field of battle, accounts for the epithet secus, or blind, given him by the poets. At a certain stage of fear, he abandons himself to his nature, destroying friend as well as foe. Why, it must be asked, would a distant, diminutive planet moving on a supposedly eternally stable orbit about the sun 
be described as angry or furious or as raging against the gods. A major portion of Martian metamorphoses was devoted to investigating the mythological traditions associated with the great heroes identified with the planet Mars, figures such as the Greek Hercules, for example, to see if there was any discernible overlap with the aforementioned Mars gods. As I documented, the overlap is at once substantial and archaic in nature, tracing to the earliest literary traditions in the 3rd millennium BCE. While it would be impossible to do justice to this vast wealth of material in a 10-minute video, it might prove instructive to examine a few traditional tales recounting the warrior hero's terrible anger. The Greek Heracles, expressly identified at the planet Mars during the Hellenistic period, was renowned for his fiery anger and deemed to be a major threat to the gods. The poet Virgil describes Heracles as follows in the Aeonid, quote, Suddenly Hercules ignited in rage. Here the word rage is ira, literally anger or rage. Seneca wrote an entire play on the subject, Hercules Furens. Ovid, in turn, speaks of the fire generated by Heracles' seething wrath. The Celtic hero Cuculon offers a striking parallel to Hercules. In traditional accounts of the great hero's fury, it is reported that he radiated intense heat, became crimson all over, and assumed a gigantic form. The epithet, the distorted one, commemorates the radical distortion of features that distinguished the Celtic hero during his battle frenzy. Indeed, the Tain describes the hero's fear as follows, quote, It was then that, as before, Cuculun's distortion came on, and he was filled with swelling and great fullness, like breath in a bladder, until he became a terrible, fearful, many-colored, wonderful giant. End of quote. The swelling of the warrior hero while in the midst of his furor is a universally occurring motif, as I have documented. Ovid, in his description of Heracles' apotheosis on Mount Eta, notes that the hero suddenly took on a gargantuan appearance. So, too, Beowulf was said to swell with anger as he prepares to meet the dragon Grendel. Maurice Sozet, summarizing the Celtic traditions, was among the few scholars to call attention to this motif. Quote, we see that all the words for hero express the notions of fury, ardor, tumescence, speed. The hero is the furious one, possessed of his own tumultuous energy. End of quote. That the hero's sudden swelling traces to a witnessed planetary events is strongly suggested by the fact that ancient astronomers called attention to Mars's propensity for swelling. Thus it is that Polynesian sky watchers knew Mars as Horo Puku Puku, quick swelling. So too Babylonian scribes described Nergal as Peshgal, literally the furious or impetuous god. Yet the word pesh also denotes to swell or to expand. A classic example of the warrior hero is offered by the ascetic Batras, renowned for his terrible furor and erratic behavior. In a popular tale recounting the hero's birth, Batras is said to burst forth from a giant's abscess on high, whereupon he fell headlong towards earth, quote, when he came down from heaven to earth, he was burning. End of quote. The igneous nature of the infant hero who fell from heaven like a thunderbolt or meteor is a decided point of emphasis. In a number of tales, the townsfolk are said to have gone to great lengths to cool him down through one means or another. In one account, the newly delivered infant plummets down from heaven and is forthwith dunked into a tub of water in an effort to quench his warrior ardor. Quote, Batras grew so furious that his steely body became red hot. He peered around, then leaped down from the heavenly heights straight onto the roof of the seven tower. He burned his way through ceilings, one after another, with his red hot body. In the lowest story of the tower, there stood a huge water tub, and into that fell the glowing hot Batras. Having cooled off in the water, he climbed out of the tub. End of quote. In a variant account of his birth, Batras is thrown into the sea to cool him off, at which point he assumes a gigantic form. Quote, when the little boy came out of the abscess at the time of his birth, they carried him to the sea and threw him in. All at once he became as big as a mountain. End of quote. Such traditions have nothing to do with human biology, needless to say. 
Rather, these vignettes encode extraordinary, i.e. cataclysmic, natural events. The curious report that Batras became as big as a mountain upon descending from heaven represents an invaluable clue. As we have documented elsewhere, when the planet Mars descended towards Earth as a meteor-like bolide along the axial column uniting the various planets, it assumed a colossal form. Like countless other warrior heroes, Batras was a notorious shapeshifter. Especially relevant here are the traditions that describe the hero as taking the form of lightning. Quote, After a turbulent and marvelous childhood, somewhat reminiscent of that of Heracles, he went to heaven where he lived from that time on, never leaving except to fall literally onto the earth in the manner of lightning, sometimes to save his fellow narts when they were in danger, but sometimes to decimate them cruelly and blindly without any clear motive. Each of these descents is described in terms and images that express his lightning nature. End of quote. On those occasions when Batras descended from heaven, it is reported that he was wont to assume a brilliant red form and become furious. The red color assigned to the descending bolide, together with the hero's identification with Ares, is tantamount to the DNA left at the scene of a crime and allows us to positively identify Batras with the planet Mars. Here it is significant to find that Mesopotamian sky watchers expressly compared the red planet to a meteor or fire falling from heaven. Thus it is that the star god Nurgle was given the epithet Meket Ashatu, denoting the fall of fire from heaven. Equally telling is the fact that the same phrase was employed to describe lightning or meteor. Far from being confined to ancient mythological traditions, the warrior hero's capacity for destructive feats of furor left an indelible mark on countless ancient rituals and customs, not to mention warriors' initiation rites around the globe. If skiddy warriors used to prepare for battle by emulating Mars's fiery anger, the Spartans and Batavian berserkers of old Europe whipped themselves into a frenzy by singing of the deeds of Heracles in the hopes that they, too, might be possessed by his spirit and prove equally formidable and invulnerable to fire or pain. Quote, Archaic warriors everywhere reenacted in masked dances the deeds of the gods and ancestors. They did so to gain the divine ecstasy of the beginning of time. In battle, when it mattered most to live in mythical time, warriors bodied forth gods and ancestors fighting in their style. Batavi, going to battle, sang of Hercules, their ancestral club-wielding hero. To summarize, traditional tales attached to the warrior hero describe him as red-hot in nature, swelling in anger, possessed by seething wrath, and radiating intense heat or lightning-like flashes. Such attributes point unequivocally to the Martian origins of the warrior hero archetype. Is it any wonder then that indigenous warriors around the globe formerly smeared their bodies with red ochre in order to embody and advertise their furor?